Hello guys, good afternoon. Um, I'm so I'm so sorry we are late. Uh, we have we faced some technicalities with web with our WebEx account. So our IT our IT department uh, is trying their best to fix it, but we we are unable to fix it on time. So now um, we will have our Lecture review for chapter 10 and 11. So for surgical instrumentation. Um, in OR and medical facility, most uh, instruments, most surgical instruments or medical equipment are are all stainless or stainless steel. So there are different types of stainless. There are um, 300 stainless, 400. So there are, in CSS there, there are two commonly used with, which is austen, austenetic and mortensetic uh, stainless. Austenetic stainless steels contain austenetic Austenite, a form of iron which can absorb more carbon than ferrite. So we will not tackle this much, but we will just familiarize what's uh, stainless um, stainless steel. So for martensitic stainless uh, is formed by creation of martensite. Martensite has been a key element for of quinch steel for hundreds of years, but was officially named in 20th century after Adult Martins. So Martensite is a body-centered cubic form of crystallized iron, which is created when heated austenite is rapidly cooled by quenching. So 400 series stainless steel and 300 series as stainless steel is commonly used in uh, surgical equipment. For 400 series, it's Martensitic. The 400 series group of stainless steels typically have an 11% chromium and 1% manganese in, uh, increase. Above the 300 series group, this stainless steel series tends to be susceptible to rust and corrosion under some condition, although heating, uh, heat treating will harden them. So mostly for our um, 400 series are scissor. So they are uh, form using 400 series stainless steel. So for 400 series stainless steel, it is actually magnetic. The metal is magnetic um, and it is heat hardened. So sample of your 400 series stainless steel is your surgical scissor. Osteotome is other uh, samples of your um, stainless steel. Hemostatic forcep is another sample of your 400 series stainless steel. Needle holder, uh, 400 series stainless steel. So for the 300 stainless steel, the 300 series stainless steel are classified as austenetic and are hard, um, hardenable only by cold working methods. While your 400, it's heat, while your uh, 300 series is cold working methods. So these grades of stainless have approximately 18% to 30% chromium and 6% to 20% nickel as their major alloying additions. So we will not um, uh, memorize this one. We will just familiarize, but uh, be familiarized with 400 series stainless steel and 300 series stainless steel. So for 300 series, the series of stainless steel al alloys are known to resist corrosion, which maintaining their strength and at high temperature. So high corrosion resistant, Unlike your 400 uh, series, they are uh, corru they are not corrosion resistant. Then for 300 series, it's non-magnetic, while your 400 series is magnetic. 
So cannot be heat hardened because they are um, cold working methods to harden this um, steel. For instrument parts, uh, we need to familiarize the some instrument parts. For example, uh, for this instrument, we have tip the jaw. There, there is neck actually here on this part. So this is the neck part, box lock, where the pivot, um, where your pivot meets. Shanks, shanks, guys, uh, where usually uh, you put the um, identification sticker or the identification tape here on this part on the shanks on the shanks here on this part if this is a smooth area where you put your identification um, tape or autoclavable tape your rache will hold the instruments on position so for finger rings so that's you the common parts of your instruments, okay? So instrument identification, in your shanks, usually we put the autoclave double sticker. So we already discussed this on our first topic, um, introduction lecture, that when you are putting uh, identification sticker or identification tape, it, it should be autoclavable, and you need to place the tape on the shanks, which means so the color coded guys, it depends on um, company policy because there are times that per room, they are color coding per room or per doctor. For example, room number one is color red, room number two is color yellow, room number three is color black. They are doing that one. To easily identify which uh, room designated for the uh, for that instruments or uh, for inventory purposes. So don't be confused with two indicator uh, to one uh, autoclavable tape. Because for this one, it's instrument identification tape. While the other one, this kind of tape is your autoclave indicator tape, which is your chemical indicator, the same as your chemical indicator. This chemical indicator is, is usually um, used when, uh, as your external indicator for packing instruments. Okay. Um, you cannot use this one if you're using paper plastic um, pouches, but most of pack packages, you can use this one. It's either linen, cloth, or muslin wrap. Then you can use the autoclavable indicator tape. So as you can see before, that's the color or uh, on the left side, the line is white and it will turn to black once exposed to steam. So this is a sample of uh, usage of indicator tape and they are uh, autoclavable indicator tape is the first option uh, as indicate as um, sealing or to seal uh, packages. Okay. Unless it is a paper plastic, but um, for all other packages, this is the first option to use your autoclavable tape, indicator tape. 
So instrument identification marking surgical instruments for identification can be done several ways. The use of tape is one popular method for identifying instruments. Instruments identification method are done in the initial supply of instruments per room or new supply of instruments are available for use. So if it is new supplied uh, instruments, then your facility, as per your facility guidelines, then um, you will identify that instrument uh, where it belongs or it belongs to room number one, room number two, then you need to identify it uh, and you need to put an identification sticker or identification tape. So if you are putting an identification tape or um, autoclavable tape on your instruments, you, you need to cut the tape on an angle to allow its edge to lay flat. So as you can see on the uh, lower part, that's the angle when you are cutting your tape, that straight line. So apply tape in chunk or in smooth surface of instruments. So um, you cannot apply any tape where there is serration, okay? Or if the edges is not smooth because there are possibility that um, your, uh, what do you call this? There are bloods or organic materials can, can lodge on the, underneath the tape. So it should be a smooth surface if you are putting the autoclavable tape or your identification tape. So apply the tape, uh, wrap the tape around the device 1.5 times around. So one, one turn and then half. So you cannot over tape or you cannot put more tape uh, in an instrument because it, it can lodge bacteria, it can lodge soil. So apply the tape with a firm pulling tension. Be careful not to apply excessive tape after the tape is applied, autoclave instruments to allow tape to help help ban the instruments. So once you are done, you can autoclave the um, instruments, and your autoclavable your autoclavable tape will stick uh, to your instruments. So this is the sample of your uh, instrument identification. So it depends on your facility, but as you can see, it is on the smooth area on the um, on the shank, mostly on the shank. Okay, um, as you can see here, this is a smooth area. This is your shank. This is your shank. This is your shank. Okay. On this part, you see, this is the smooth area of uh, tissue forcep. Okay, so you cannot put on this side because this is not smooth area. There are possibility that um, organic materials might lodge on uh, underneath the sticker if you are putting the, the autoclave bubble tape here. Okay. So replacing tape and coded rings, actually there are another options aside from the um, autoclavable tape, color coded tape, there are coded rings. The, co the coded rings are silicon rings that you can insert again the same on the shanks or on the smooth surface. Um, when using tape to identify instruments, inspection of the tape each time that the device is processed is very important. Replace tape or rings when loose, replace tape or rings when damaged, replace tape when peeling, replace tape uh, or rings when color fades. So when peeling, then you need to replace it before it totally uh, peel out because some of the debris of your tape might go to the patient. Uh, if there's a procedure, then it will stuck on your uh, to your patient. So, for example, um, 
replace the tape rings when color fades. The reason why, for example, this is your pink color or your blue color, your blue color, your pink uh, identification color coded uh, tape. Um, times pass, times by, by, if it is usually um, used, then there's possibility the color will turn to black. Then you cannot identify if it is blue or black or it is red or black. So it will darken on, on uh, as per longer usage of the tape. So usually we are replacing the tape every once a month or as necessary. So there are different types of instrument identification. The other type is heat fused nylon. This color coding is often referred to as dipping. So they will dip the instruments to a certain coating, nylon coating, then it will um, perma not permanently, but um, it will coat with a color coded nylon. So heat fused nylon is a powdered coating process that leaves a thin layer of colored nylon on the instruments. So nylon coating can last years. However, once it begins to chip, all nylon must be removed from the instruments because it can cause infection to your patient. This is your sample of your heat fused nylon. Laser etching, this durable process is usually done by the manufacturer or outside vendor. So this is your sample of your laser etching. Dot matrix, actually the, your dot matrix is, um, there's a small barcode on your instruments. This is your dot matrix. Okay, this is your dot matrix. So, yes, this is your uh, bigger, bigger image. This is your dot matrix. Guys, as you can see, some instruments, they are identified as per doctor. So there are, there are some instruments are, that are personal to specific doctor. So they are putting the name of the doctor. So there are also a um, serial number. So as you can see, there are serial number here, here. So usually this uh, serial number um, are, play, are in place to easily locate or identify the instruments. And the same with your dot matrix. So point of use instrument care. Your point of use instrument care is that actually we already discussed this, but we are just repeating it because it's also um, uh, stated on your chapter 10. Yes. So point of use instrument care, keep instrument moist. So before transporting the instrument or the use instrument to CSSD or decontamination room, then it should be sprayed with enzymatic spray or enzymatic foam to keep the instrument moist. And you need, do not allow instruments to dry with organic materials, which means the blood cannot be dried because it is hard to remove. So, and also it can damage your um, instruments. So not, not only blood, but other organic materials like saline solution, liquids, betadine, it should not be dried on, on the instruments. Do not allow instruments to dry with organic materials. So, or you cannot soak instruments with other liquids. So for example, um, for this one, there is a peep. Okay, there's already a holes on the instrument. 
with constant soaking on a liquid. So some are rust, especially if you are um, uh, soaking the, in the instrument, if your doctor or your physician are, uh, if your doctor and nurses are soaking the instruments to say sa saline solution or saline solution. So they should be informed that they should not soak instruments to any liquid. So for instrument testing, there are different types of testing. Um, there are commonly uh, tests uh, in CSSD that are done in uh, hospital and medical center. For example, for this um, red and yellow latex, actually this is a latex, guys. So in order to check the functionality of your scissor, then you need to cut some portion of your latex rubber. It's either red or yellow. So for your scissor testing, greater than 4.5 inches scissor, then you need to um, cut a portion of your red latex. So if it, it, it cleans cut uh, the latex rubber, it means your scissor, which is greater than 4.5, is still um, working or on good condition or if it's, it is still sharp. So scissor testing, smaller than four inches, you need to cut a uh, latex rubber on a uh, yellow color. So there are two commonly used, which is your um, red and yellow latex. But uh, let's be reminded that um, in CSSD, we, uh, we, um, we are encouraging or we are doing uh, to improve our services, that's the reason why we need to change or we, we need to remove some latex uh, products um, in CSS department because it can it can cause any allergies to our patient or any latex sensitivity to the patient. That's why it's um, from red to yellow, there are new products, which is non-latex product, which is orange. So for orange latex uh, rubber, not latex free rubber, so they will use to cut uh, this uh, AD scissor to cut this orange color latex free pro uh, product. So instead of red and yellow, they will use the uh, orange color. So it means, the orange color means it is latex, latex free. So if ever um, you need to test for your um, endoscope scissor, which is used in uh, in your endoscope, so this is one of the uh, instruments they will put on your endoscope. So you need to test if you need to test the sharpness of your endoscope scissor. Then you need to cut one ply of non-woven facial tissue, which is there's no um, lint or there is no um, once you cut it, it is clean cut. So there's no other the um, there's no lint uh, that will attach to the instruments. So. Uh, we are suggest that's why they are suggesting a non-woven facial tissue, but it should be one one ply one ply only. So for scissor guys, it should be tested in CSSD if it is dull or if it is sharp, because one the surgeon and the nurses don't have any time to test the functionality of each instrument once they are in OR table. So they will use it directly. For example, for this scissor, then they use it in an organ, to cut an organ or to cut a tissue. If it is dull, actually it can damage an organ. 
So if it is not sharp, it can damage an organ. So that's the reason why we need to test um, instruments before pouching it or before pouching them. So for your keratin and laminectomy, this is a sample. This is your sample um, instruments for keratin and laminectomy. So for this instrument, guys, you need to inspect for cracks on both sides. This is your bone cutter, okay? This will cut bones. So you need to inspect. You need to inspect here. If there's a crack because when they, once they cut this on the bone, it will break. There's crack. You need to inspect for blood and tissue on this area because most blood will stuck on this area. You need to inspect that it should be smooth or fitted. Attach. You see, there's no. Um, As you can see, you cannot see any space. So it fits um, well with once uh, they close the, the instruments. So if your um, surgeon needs a different size of your laminectomy or keratin, Usually, it is uh, stated on your instruments. So for this area, you need to check if the spring is still connected so that once they uh, press this one, it's still working. So it can re be retracted and it can go back to its original uh, position. So for this one, you need to inspect for cracks because once you press this instrument, it might get broken or it will not be reus uh, usable, especially in an emergency. So... The test for keratin and laminectomy is you need to cut or bite a portion on an index card. So, for example, it's a one millimeter um, keratin, then it should be like this. A clean cut with clean, uh, no, uh, it's a clean, clean cut, no groove on the edges or no um, remaining paper that was not able to uh, cut. And this is a sample of your keratin index card by test. So for your curette, chesel, and osteotome, they are your um, they are used uh, to shave bone. So the test for this one, guys, is that you need to shave a part or a portion of um, a plastic dowel rod. So for a plastic dowel rod, you need to shave uh, a portion of it. Once it can shave some plastic rod, some of portion of this, then it means your instruments are still working or they are still sharp. So they can still shave bone. For index card, you need to be reminded because there are only two tests shown in the book, which is your index card and your double rod 
and your uh, latex red and uh, latex yellow. The orange is actually not uh, written in your book. So for an index card for Runger, all Runger guys, or Kerason, laminectomy, and double action is uh, te the test is your index card. And your bone cutter is index card. So all instruments, which is Runger's, is index card plus bone cutter. Because this is Kerason Runger's, um, laminectomy Runger's, and double action Runger's. For lubrication, you need to lubricate um, instruments, especially on your where the pivot is. So, whatever the working area of your uh, instrument or where, where there's two, um, where the pivot is located, you need to lubricate it. So if there's an excess oil, you need to remove it. You need to wipe a disinfectant wipe just to remove your excess oil. So once there's, a, a, there's too much oil, um, place in an instrument, or put in the instrument uh, was put in the instrument. Once you sterilize the instrument, excess oil will go on your pouches. So your pouch will be considered wet, or there's a mark of oil, and it will be considered contaminated. So there are some lubrication guys for your um, hand pieces. For example, for this one, you are intended uh, oil solution or apparatus just to oil a specific instrument. So you need to check for it if this oil is applicable to this instrument. So this is your sample your, of your powered surgical instruments. Powered surgical instruments is either pneumatic, powered by um, air, powered by electricity. So it's either battery operated, pneumatic powered or electrical powered. So you are advised to not immerse unless specified in your IFU. So if your instruction for use manual said that it can be immersed, then you can immerse it. But if you cannot read anything regarding soaking of the powered surgical instruments, then you are not allowed to immerse your powered surgical instruments. Actually, this is your sample of your powered um, Surgical instruments. So you for endoscope classification, there are three types of endoscope guys. Your rigid uh, endoscope, semi-rigid, and your flexible. Your rigid uh, rigid uh, endoscope guys, they are straight and they cannot be bent, they can be bent, but on limited bending only. For your semi-rigid, semi they can be bent, but on your flexi flexible, they can actually um, access any parts of your body. So this endoscope has a LED or light emitting diode. So they have light that the main source or supply of light once the, the endoscope is inside the body of the patient. So 
uh, let's be reminded if the light fiber shows dark area, it means that the LED is damaged. So it, um, there is no um, good visual uh, visual image if your LED is damaged. So you're for endoscope guys from patient use from patient use then you need to pre-clean the uh, the endoscope after pre-cleaning the uh, endoscope it should be uh, tested for leakage if there's a leak on that instruments or the inner inner channels of your endoscope has a leak or or no then you can proceed with the cleaning once it is clean, you will start with your disinfection for your endoscope. Um, you need to use a high level disinfectant specific for endoscope or AER and uh, automated endoscope preprocessor, then dry, then store for distribution. This is your sample of your endoscope. Uh, Classification, this is your rigged uh, endoscope. So for your rigged endoscope, guys, it is useful if the procedure or organ is relatively straight line access. So if it is uh, accessible only to, to a straight point, then they can use your endoscope classification. So there are minimal flexing and it can, it can damage for flexing beyond limit. So the flexing of your endoscope is actually limited. So for your semi-rigged um, endoscope, shaft is very thin. So as you can see, the difference, the shaft of your rigged endoscope is uh, bigger and thicker, but smaller. Okay, for your semi-rigid um, endoscope, your shaft is very thin. This is actually they are all stainless. So it is relatively straight line when going inside the body of your patient, and it requires a slight bending. It can slightly bend. For your endos flexible endoscope, this is the sample of your flexible endoscope. For your flexible endoscope, where straight line access is not possible, so if ever your uh, rigged endoscope is not applicable, they cannot use it, then they need to use your flexible endoscope, especially in the esophagus, if they are going to your esophagus, then they need to use a flexible endoscope rather than semi-rigged or rigged endoscope. Or when your doctors need to check or to do a biopsy on your lungs or kidney, then they will use a flexible endoscope. So endo endoscope decontamination should begin in the OR by wiping or by spraying with enzymatic spray or enzymatic foam to prevent drying. So damage occurred due to the following, improper placement of the items in transport container. So there are specific transport container for your endoscope. So improper handling, there are proper handling, um, proper ways of handling your endoscope. You, you cannot uh, uh, carry your endoscope uh, as you like. You are, you cannot allow, you are not allowed to bend any any other channels or any other um, um, areas of your endoscope. So improper use of cleaning accessories such as brushes and forced air. So there are specific brushes sizes to clean your um, endoscope. So improper chemical use. You need. We are aware that before we need to soak instruments, we need to um, wipe instruments with chemicals, we need to check if 
our, our chemicals is compatible with your instruments. Then if not, then we need, uh, we should not use it. For endoscopes, some uh, technicians, they are, uh, they will just choose whatever they want for the cleaning of endoscope. So there are intended uh, chemicals for endoscope uh, cleaning. So damage occurred due to the following, closely inspect for damage and clean cleanliness. Functions such as light outputs, image quality, you need to check for the light if, there, uh, if your LED is not darkened, so it, it's still working. But if it is darkened, then it means your light or your LED is uh, damaged. Um, all endoscope, the distal and proximal window should be inspected for cleanliness, wipe, and 70% um, alcohol and non lean soft cloth. So we are using non lean soft cloth to wipe your endoscope, or sometimes we are using the sponge, endoscope sponge. So this is your transport, uh, endoscope transport cart or transport con container. So there are different types. Um, uh, the different ways how to transport your endoscope. For your transport bin, for endoscope, it is pre-soaked. There's a soaking solution. Then you, you can uh, put your instrument without damaging the endoscope channels. While your endoscope transport, it is the same. You can soak, there's a soaking solution for that, and then um, it is intended for endoscope. As you can see, there are specific um, endoscope um, container for transport or for uh, sending it to the contamination room. So proper handling techniques for proper handling techniques of your endoscope guys, this is the proper way on how to hold your endoscope, especially when you are um, removing the endoscope on the transport bin because you need to clean it, then that's the proper way in handling the endoscope because the, the, uh, you are not allowed to bend or to kink the, the inner channels or the outer channels because it can damage the inner channels for this one, you are not allowed to king or to bend this part. That's the reason why that's the, prep, the proper handling of your endoscope. You need to hold on the this part. So improper handling can continue to damage the following scope components, insertion tube, distal end, light guide connector. Safe holding techniques include hold insertion tube, distal end, and light guide connector in one hand. So grasp the control head and se separate hand. Over, over manipulation of angulation knob can stretch the wire leading to loss of motion range in the distal tip. So this is the proper way of handling your endoscope. So this is your drying and storage of um, your endoscope. The, uh, on this area, once you are done uh, disinfecting your endoscope, then you can store here to dry, to avoid moisture. Guys, in drying endoscope, you are avoiding moisture because you can damage the inner channels or especially the camera or the light or the LED of your uh, endoscope. So this is a storage area uh, for drying and temporary storage. So once you, once you transport it, actually there's a specific bin or there's a specific container when you are transporting your um, endoscope. So I, I'll show you some videos in a while. So let's proceed. 
surgical instruments staining. So there are different. Just a moment. I think this is already the video. So this is your endoscope. Step one, pre-cleaning. Just
So that's the proper way on how to pre-clean um, the endoscope prior to sending your endos uh, the endoscope to the decontamination area. So usually it should be done um, by any representative of OR on the OR um, OR room or the user itself will do the pre-cleaning prior to sending it to the CSSD or prior collection um, of the instruments by the CSSD technician. So the next step is the cleaning process. So just familiarize the cleaning uh, process of your endoscope.
So guys, if you, for your step one, it's a pre-cleaning before the transport. Your step two is the cleaning process before performing the high-level disinfection. So as you can see, the important uh, um, protocols in the cleaning process is that you need to um, handle the instruments properly. The channel should not be king or it should not be folded. And you need to rinse it with distilled water. The inner channel should be uh, rinsed with distilled water. And for final, um, final step is that before uh, wiping your instruments is that you need to um, flush your, ins your inner channels of your endoscope with air. So that's the protocols that you need to remember. Um, for the next step, it is the high-level disinfection. As you as you can remember, the abbreviation of GoPH. Okay. Um, for endoscope, it cannot be sterilized. So the the procedures we need is that to perform a high-level disinfection for your endoscope. So for your high level disinfection, please don't forget the go pH uh, abbreviation. Okay, uh, the go pH is your glutaraldehyde (OPA), hydrogen peroxide, and your parasitic, uh, parasitic acid. So the next step is um, alcohol flushing for the high level disinfection and then soaking and then storage.
Um, so guys, that's the process of your high level disinfection and storage. For your storage, as you can see, it needs to be on your storage cabinet before uh, transporting your instruments to the OR. So if ever you don't need, um, your surgeon don't need the endoscope, uh, then you don't, uh, you are not allowed to put the endoscope for storage in the in the carrying case, which means your carrying case should be used only once you need to transport or once you need to deliver the endoscope for procedure. So please be reminded, um, there are two uh, chemicals used, which is glutardehyde and then your alcohol. Okay, for your I need to write for your chemicals, guys. Should I write? Okay, for your um, chemicals, please don't forget your CPAC abbreviation for low level and intermediate level. Okay, for CPAC, what is C? Your endoscope is actually a CPAC for low level and intermediate level. Your endoscope is semi-critical instruments. So for semi-critical instruments, you need to use a high level disinfect, uh, disinfectant, but uh, it's okay if you are combining a low level and uh, high level disinfectant. For C, it's chlorine. For I, is your iodophores. For P, is your phenolics. A, for alcohol. Actually, they are using alcohol. And Q, is for quaternary ammonium. For your um, high level, we are using GoHP or GoPH. So your GoPH is Lotardehyde, OPA or Orthotaldehyde. Um, hydrogen peroxide and your parasitic acid. Okay, so that's the reason why you are using glutardehyde for your endoscope since that's uh, the minimum requirements for your um, semi critical instruments. So for your color um, instrument discoloration, there are different colors that you might encounter um, with your instruments. The, there are uh, several types of reasons because, uh, for example, you are soaking the instruments to a specific solution or the, there is dried blood 
or you are using tap water instead of um, pure water or distilled water. So we will discuss for um, surgical instrument staining. For orange brown, it may appear as rust. It is the same as on your uh, slides. The problem is often due to phosphate layers on the instrument, which may develop as a result of any of the following, dried blood or debris. So it is constantly dried. Uh, your user did not remove any organic materials or any blood on your instruments. They did not do a pre-cleaning. There's iodine. They are soaking the instrument in an iodine or betadine solution. The, there's a detergent residue instead using a, a specific chemicals. They are using like uh, laundry chemicals, uh, laundry soap. High alkaline detergent, surgical wraps, or cold sterilization solution, or your soaking solution, uh, chemical soaking solution. The solution is perform an eraser test. You are not sure, or it is not guaranteed that it, if there's a golden or brown orange color on your instruments, that it is a rust. Okay, there's possibility that it's only a stain. So, in order to know if it is a, a stain or a rust, then you need to do a eraser test. The eraser test is using an eraser which is for, for this slides, they are showing the pencil eraser, but for us, we are using the white block, white eraser block. So if the discoloration is removed, when you remove the stain or the color, then it is not a rust, then it's only a stain. So if the metal underneath is smooth and clean, the stain usually points to dried blood or debris. So if pitting is observed or there are holes in your instruments, then that's possibly a rust, okay? Or um, small divots in the uh, metal underneath the discoloration, this can contribute to rust. So through rust, a combination of any of the following, mixing the similar metals, that's the reason why you are not allowed to mix any um, the similar metals. For aluminum or stainless steel, you need to mix them together. The brass, copper, or gold, you need to separate it uh, all together. All different metals should be uh, removed because sometimes, more, most of the times, they are reacting um, when you are soaking or you, when you are putting them on the mechanical cleaner. So dry blood or debris, if uh, your user is really not doing a pre-cleaning, then there's a possibility to get an instant, not instant, but a rust due to um, point of use uh, preparation before transporting your instruments. So improper cleaning, high alkaline detergents, usually our detergents uh, use is neutral. There are some chemicals that, um, that are acidic, Yes, there are times. There are times also that al uh, high alkaline detergents, but you need to check if your instruments is capable of handling this kind of detergents. How many uh, minutes needs to be soaked? Because, for example, um, your alkaline um, solutions are capable for um, cleaning aluminum st uh, stainless steel or stainless steel instruments. But it said on your IFU that it should be soaked only for five minutes and then you soak for 30 minutes. So there's a possibility that it can create rust or discoloration. Your chemicals and your ultrasonic machine, it will change the color. It, it will get rust. Water quality, high iron content, surgical wraps, cold sterilization solution. So do not mix the similar metals, separate instruments by metal type, non-anodized aluminum, brass, copper, chrome plated, and single-use instruments. A plating in reaction may occur. This reaction can result in permanent damage and staining. So sometimes you are, um, it's either rust, 
it's either the instrument will block will be black or gray in color instead it is silver or aluminum it's it is uh shiny silver then it will turn to blackish or grayish color so a plating reaction may occur this re reaction can uh, result in permanent damage and staining so do not allow instruments to soak in blood or moisture for extended le length of time actually guys in or the protocols of the nurses once the physician will remove the instrument from the body they will automatically wipe it before returning uh, the instruments in the or table so they will wipe it with gauze so then check for water quality tests uh, water quality use a neutral ph detergent that's the common um, ph used in cssd remove all debris from lock areas teeth crevices and serration so rinse thoroughly with demineralized water or deionized water for your free rinsing please be um, don't forget okay for free rinsing for free rinsing the first option is deionized water the second is if you don't have the term they use is utility water or tap water for your final rinsing the first option is distilled water or pure water deionized water and reverse osmosis water So dry all instruments thoroughly. So before pouching your instruments, you need to dry them. Before uh, the point of use, before sending the instruments to CSST, you need to make sure that all liquids are removed, that your instrument is dry without any organic materials. If there is, then you, are, uh, you need to put any um, spray or enzymatic foam or enzyme, enzymatic spray to keep the instruments moist. So blue gray usually occur from improper use of cold sterilization steal the soaking solution a cold sterile land is a chemical agent that can destroy all microbial life including high resistant bacterial endospores uh, when used according to the direction of the product table prolonged immersion to disinfecting or sterilizing solution can damage surgical instruments surgical ins instruments should not soak longer than the recommended 20 minutes or as per the manufacturer guidelines as i said if the your manufacturer Manufacturer said or telling that in your IFU that uh, you need to soak your instruments within 10 minutes, then you are allowed to soak your instruments for 10 minutes. Sometimes we forget to remove your the instruments within 10 minutes uh, time time frame. So as per um, or IFU instruction for use manual, then we need to follow them. For solution, follow solution manufacture IFU for temperature and soak time. So what temper uh, what is the temperature of your soaking solution? It's 27 to 43 degrees. Should be followed. If it said not beyond 50, then you should you should follow not beyond 50. Even the ISAM will tell that the maximum is 60 degrees Celsius, then 
If your manufacturer IFU said it is until 55, then you need to follow your manufacturer IFU. Due to the um, change solution per manufacturer IFU, due to the inherent limitation of using liquid chemical sterilant, their use should be restricted to reprocessing critical devices that are heat sensitive and incompatible with other sterilization methods. So you are only allowed to use cold sterilization if your instruments is not cap is if only you are not capable of um, uh, they are not capable in uh, steam sterilization or if they cannot withstand the steam or heat. So color type of stain, there are black. The most common black stains are due to acid reaction. So black stain may result from high pH in detergents, exposure to ammonia. So you need to check the detergent pH. Do not use harsh chemicals. So you need, actually guys, you need to check if this metal is applicable. If you are using um, high acid or high pH uh, or acidic uh, chemicals, if you're using acidic chemicals, then you need to check first if these instruments are capable in, um, uh, when you soak them, they are capable um, in, uh, handling or if they can tolerate your instruments can tolerate any acidic chemicals so you need to check the IFU if what metal is allowed how many minutes they are allowed to be soaked for example your um, high P acidic chemicals it says that no stainless steel should be soaked then you are not allowed to soak the stainless steel For blue and black, they are usually a result of plating and may be uh, difficult to remove from the surface. The cause of this stain is mixing the similar metals. This is the, we tried this one actually. <laughs> Before I tried this one, when we mix chemicals because our, our medical center is quite busy and we mix uh, different types of metals on one ultrasonic cycle, then the color changes to black. So do not mix the similar metals, separate instruments by metal type, non-anodized aluminums, brass, copper, chrome-plated, single-use instruments, etc. A plating reaction may occur. This reaction can result in permanent damage and staining. It cannot be reversed. Light or dark spots. Spots are often results of slow evaporation of water on the instruments. The mineral deposits related to mineral content of the water may remain on the instruments. So contributing factor, steam impurities, residual detergents, reusable wrappers and surgical towels also contrib contribute to spotting or you did not um, uh, do the final rinsing, which is using pure water or distilled water. So for solution, do not allow instruments to air dry. Dry instruments in a timely manner. Check steam water quality. Use distilled or demineralized or deionized water. Perform adequate rinsing of laundry detergent and surgical towels. For loaner instruments, instruments are loaned from a vendor. From the word loaner, we are borrowing instrument from the vendor or from the manufacturer. Uh, from the vendor. So loaner instruments, instruments are loaned from a vendor for a special case or procedure and will be returned to the vendor. If this is the case, guys, if your facility is a borrowing instrument from the vendor, then upon receiving, uh, upon receiving for the uh, loan instruments, you need to check uh, there's a receiving receipt actually you need to uh, indicate who, who is the one delivering who is the one receiving from your company what instrument what type how many boxes or like that so for for your loaner instruments when you, once you receive it then you need to sterilize 
uh, your instruments, even if even if they are already sterilized, that you need to re-sterilize them before um, processing or before using. I mean, so loaner receipt. There are date, time, date when they when they deliver it to your facility, the time, the signature of the delivery person, the initial or receiving person from your facility. The surgeon name who will use or the physician name who will use that instrument, the patient name where to use it, to whom uh, will use it, um, number of tray, how many trays they delivered, if it is implant, how many implants, then the inventory sheet. The inventory sheet is that uh, it indicates what instruments um, it is in inside the tray or what are the list of instruments they they provide? So you need to check it before um, the receiving person will uh, will left from your facility from your facility. So you need to inform if there's a lacking instruments from your inventory list. Then you need to inform them unless you you want to pay them because any loss of your of any instruments you you need to pay them. So decontamination of loaner, all loaner should be cleaned and decontaminated upon receipt and after use. Instruments that appears clean or in sterilized container or wrap should be considered contaminated and must be processed accordingly. Should be packed as per IFU, should use uh, enzymatic detergent or cleaning instruction as per IFU. So guys, we will go on our practice questions. So in answering questions, please don't forget, do not choose or look for familiar words or answer. You should read each question and note the important, uh, important details. Read each options and rationalize one by one. Eliminate as per your rationalization. Choose on at least two of your choice, two of your remaining choices. So if you are answering true or false, find the words or statement that makes it false. Do not rely only by answering false without knowing why it became false. So as an additional information, you need to know why this statement became false. So, so let's try this exam questions. So the package closure for sterilization that is considered best practice is which of the following? A, indicator tape, B, heat sealing, C, self-adhesive, D, manufacturer recommended rubber band. So the package closure for sterilization that is considered best practice is which of the following? A, indicator tape, B, heat seal, C, self-adhesive seal. D, manufacturer recommended rubber bands. Okay. Please type your answer. So the package closure for sterilization that is considered best practice is which of the following? A, indicator tape, B, heat seal, C, self-adhesive seal, or D, manufacturer recommended rubber band. Okay, let, um, let's start with a question. Package closure. The question asks for package closure. Best uh, practice. 
So if we are asked by um, for package closure, so for practice question, so the package closure for serialization that is considered best practice is which of the following? So I will eliminate first the manufacturer recommended rubber band. Rubber band, it's not recommended for any closure of any packages. So there are two types of closing any um, packages or pouches. Four pouches, guys. Okay. Four pouches. We have the self adhesive seal and your heat sealing or heat seal. That's it, that's the best practice for um For your pouches, actually, for your pouches, it is the self-adhesive seal is the first option. For package closure, okay, so I will remove heat seal because this is the second option for pouches. For heat, for package closure, actually, it is the indicator tape. The reason why. Your indicator tape will seal the packages or the tray of your um, instruments with indicator. It, it, it has already an outside indicator which your uh, which the user can see automatically once they use the instrument. So the self uh, the heat seal is for pouches. The self adhesive is for pouches. While your indicate, indicator tape is your four packages. So it's either cloth, green cloth, muslin wrap. So, so the answer is letter A. So package closure of best serialization, what is considered best practice? Um, tape designated as indicator tapes are considered best practice because they are made specifically to withstand serialization and they, they will change color after being exposed to the serialization process. They do not, however, provide proof that adequate serialization of package contents has occurred. So the next question is, for sterilization, multi-parts instrument should be A, spread out, B, keep intact, C, disassembled, D, laid flat. For multi-parts instruments, okay? For multi-parts instruments, okay, let's start with for sterilization, okay? Then for multi-parts instruments, spread out wrong because he need to place this multi-parts instrument in one uh, packages or one tray. So keep intact, that's possible, question mark. Laid flat wrong disassembled this question mark so let's remember okay once we receive the instruments once we do the manual brushing we need to disassemble the uh, disassemble the instrument for manual brushing and mechanical cleaning Once we place the instrument for inspection, 
then we need to put them apart. Uh, put them together or assemble them. We need to put them together or assemble them. The reason why is that we need to inspect the instruments. We need to check the functionality of this instrument before um, pouching, uh, pouching the instruments. So when you inspect and you uh, when you find out that the instrument is okay and it, it is working, then you need to pouch it. Once you pouch it, you need to disassemble again. for pouching, then sterilization. So the answer is letter C. So for sterilization, multi-part instrument should be multi-part instrument should be disassembled for sterilization and unless the instrument manufacturer has provided validated IFU to the contrary. So if ever you are always be the the uh, the, the your manufacturer should be all should be followed all the time. So if ever your IFU said that you need you don't need to disassemble it, then you are not allowed to di disassemble those instruments. But if there's no specific instruction or not written in your IFU and it is a multi-part, then you need to disassemble it. So instrument in this, uh, this repair should be tagged or labeled and taken out for service until repair. So disposable components of patient care equipment should be, should be spread out. Bigay ko kay Mamdes. So for a practice question, next question, disposable components of patient care equipment should be spread out. So A, remove and discarded at the point of use. Remove and inspected before reusing. Remove and transported separately to the central service department. Remove and transported along with the patient care equipment to the CS department. So the question is, spread out i mean disposable components so I, at the point of use preparation okay we, we will start remove and discard it at the point of use that's possible maybe or this is my possible answer Remove it because I need to read the next uh, the ne next option. Remove and inspect inspected before reusing. You need to remove and inspect before reusing. That's possible. You can any disposable guys. You can reuse them as long as they are um, they are functioning uh, as if they are new. Okay. Any reusable 
can be reused can be disinfected as long as they are still working the same um, quality as if they are new. So that's possible, the letter B. C, remove and transported separately to the CS uh, department. Transported separately to CS department is wrong. Why? There is no um, disposable, any disposable items that might reach CSSD department. Your letter D, remove and transported along with the patient care equipment to the CSSD. Remove and transported with patient care equipment to CSSD. Again, wrong. Why? No. Um, Disposable will reach the CSSD department. It should be discarded from the point of use. So the answer is letter A, remove and discarded at the point of use. So the answer is letter A. So next question. So remove and discarded at the point of use, disposable components such as pads, tubing, suction canister should be removed or any disposable, uh, on any sharps, any disposable sharps should be removed from each piece of equipment and discarded at the point of use. Only those items that will be clean and return to use should be transported to the decontamination area. Okay. Yes, question. What's your question? If the disposable item should not reach the CSSD area, mm -hmm. Um, what do you mean that, why why do we need to inspect them? Ah, okay. Um, there are some scenario, some cases that your nurse, your physician will inform the CSSD technician that um, this is a disposable uh, equipment then please sterilize it and we need we will reuse it to the next uh, patient. So if that is the case, then uh, you can sterilize it as long as the, the it's, that instrument is working the same as it is new, okay? Or the functionality of that instrument is still in, intact or the quality of that instrument is still um, working, okay? So if ever there's, there's no instruction, if you receive a uh, disposable instruments, which is cannot, uh, there's no specific instruction from the user if it needs to be reused or it needs to be uh, sterilized again, then it is an incident, incident report. So you need to file, a, a, the CS technician will file an incident uh, report to the user or where the instruments came. Okay. Uh, actually, all instruments should, all disposable instruments should be discarded as long as um, you, you, you will only need to uh, sterilize it if needed as per instruction of your physician if they need it. But all, actually not all, but um, majority or 99% of the um, disposable equipment should be um, should be discarded. 
actually guys there are some equipment for example your dappen dish it is disposable dappen dish i'll try to find a dappen dish dappen dish in for example Eighty percent. For example, guys, for this um, scenario, okay. This is a dappin dish. This is used in dental. The plastic one is your disposable, and your uh, glass one, dapp glass dappin dish, is your reusable. Sometimes. If there is a need, because this is a non-critical instrument, so you can you are allowed to sterilize this. And for this one, this is autoclavable. So, for example, for this one, your uh, physician wants the Duffin dish to be used for the next case because they don't have any. Uh, I mean, they don't have any remaining Duffin dish. So, as per instruction of your um, physician. You can you can uh, sterilize any disposable as long as it is functioning the same as it is on the first uh, use. So it depends, but majority of the disposable should be um, disposed unless instructed by your um, physician. And not because they are instructing you to uh, sterilize it, you will follow them. You need to test, you need to check your instrument if if still it, it is working the same as it's new. If not, then you can ask them that you cannot, uh, you can tell them that you cannot sterilize them because um, it is not working the same as it is the first, uh, the same as uh, you first use it. So, any question? So, patient care equipment, next question, should be cleaned by following patient care equipment should be cleaned following um, So please answer, patient care equipment should be cleaned by following what standard? A, uh, the biomedical engineer department instruction. B, common protocols for equipment cleaning. C, healthcare administrative order. Or D, the equipment manufacturer instruction. So it is uh, protocols. So, for patient care equipment, any equipment should be clean if it needs to be clean. Biomedical engineer department instruction for cleaning, possible. Because the bio, your biomedical engineer, they are the first hand of your equipment. 
So second is common protocols for equipment cleaning. That's possible. What is ever common is applicable to So this is possible. Um, so healthcare administra administrative order. So healthcare administrative order will not interfere with the cleaning process of any instrument or equipment. The equipment manufacturer instruction. So. The first choice, guys, in every cleaning equipment, chemicals, usage, or it should be the manufacturer instruction should be followed. So they are the first um, first option to consider. Okay, first, the common protocols for equipment, that's possible, but we need to follow whatever manufacturer instructed as per the equipment, the instruments, or as per the chemicals. So they are the first option uh, to choose. So how often must patient care equipment be processed? Once a day, every after use, every week, only when soil is visible. So every week is wrong. Only when soil is visible is wrong because we are cleaning instruments visible or not visible soil. So it's either once a day or after every use. For once a day, you cannot do once a day because you, you cannot reuse the same instrument that your first patient used. So every after uh, use, it should be clean. It should be delivered right away to the CSSD department. So patient care equipment must be processed after every use. All patient care equipment dispensed for use must be considered contaminated and handled as such after use, regardless of its appearance. So at the end of the leasing contract, if you are uh, borrowing um, instruments, which of the following typically occur? The equipment is discarded. You, need, you will discard the equipment, the lease uh, equipment. The facility can return the equipment or purchase it. The equipment is sold. You, you will sold the, the instrument. The facility owns the equipment. So after the contract, you lease it, you borrow it, you loan it, then so this is a protocols for loaner, loaner instruments. So for loaner, for leasing contract, it's a loan, okay? For loan instruments, the equipment is discarded. You are not allowed because you, it, that's not yours. You're just leasing it. You're just borrowing it. You cannot sell because your facility doesn't own it. And you cannot own it unless you will buy or purchase that equipment or you will return those equipment to the vendor. So the, up, the answer is letter B.
So at the end of a leasing contract, which of the following typically occur? The facility can return the equipment or purchase it. At the end of a leasing contract, the facility can return the equipment or purchase it. This is different from outright purchase or a rental. Leasing is, actually it's the same with rental. It's loan. An endoscope that fails a leak test should be discarded immediately, shipped to a service technician for repair, immediately sterilized, plug as potential hazard. Okay, for an endoscope that fails, a leak test should be you cannot discard it immediately. Why? It's very expensive. Immediately sterilize. Is it right or wrong? It says endoscope are done by high level disinfection only. Potential hazard possible. But the answer is it should be shipped to a service technician for repair. So guys, be, please be reminded that before sending um, your endoscope or for before sending any instruments for repair, you need to do the high level disinfection so that your uh, biomedical engineer will uh, handle the instrument safely or handle the equipment safely. Um, safely. If, uh, if ever uh, it needs to be sterilized for some instruments, then you need to sterilize them before sending that equipment to a biomedical engineer for repair. So an endoscope that fails a leak test should be shipped to a service technician for repair. So each manufacturer provides information about procedures for reprocessing a flexible endoscope with an identified leak. So when any equipment enters a healthcare facility, it should be safely checked and tested. This is done by the which of the following. Equipment enters a healthcare facility.
safety check and tested. For, for joint commission, the, um, they don't care if it is um, safely checked. For your external sources, they don't have the authority to check any safety check on your facility. So, your joint commission are not um, the right organization or for any equipment that enters your, your facility should be safety checked by either this one or your biomedical uh, uh, clinical engineering department. So the first option To do the medical device checking before usage so the first first option is biomedical engineer or department your second option is your medical device officer if you don't have a biomedical engineer and it is your MDO or medical device officer um, assigned to check the safety of your equipment the third is if you don't have in your facility a medical device officer, then it is the responsibility of your central service technician. Or department. So the correct answer is letter D, biomedical clinical engineering department. Okay, guys, please be reminded for any equipment and every facility, it should be uh, first start with biomedical engineer or biomedical department, but not all facility has a biomedical engineer or department. So it is uh, assigned person, which is medical device officer, will do the task. If there is none, for example, small clinics, very small clinics, for us, we don't have biomedical engineer here, but we have a medical device officer. Um, if you don't have uh, both, the number one and two, then he will go directly to each department. For example, um, nursing department, whatever equipment uh, they have, they will check for the functionality of that uh, equipment. But still, we will ask a third party uh, to do the calibration and to do the PPM or the safety checking of the instruments. But the initial checking, it will start with, upon receiving the equipment, it will start with biomed, medical device officer, and the department itself, and its staff. So when any equipment enters a healthcare facility, it must be safely checked and tested. Biomedical, uh, biomedical clinical engineer department, central service technician partner with biomed to assure that equipment is tested and functions properly. Actually, most of uh, equipment, the user knows and have the greater knowledge with that instruments or that equipment. So aside from biomed, it should be checked also by the um, user itself. So patient care equipment that is not visibly sold should be 
not visibly soiled should be A, be handled as contaminated, B, added to inventory, C, stored immediately, D, sent to biomed department for inspection. Okay, equipment not visibly soiled. So be handled as contaminated, possible. Added to inventory, you are not allowed to add any equipment which is not processed or not um, or did not undergo the routine process of sterilization. So stored immediately, you cannot store an equipment immediately, especially if it is, uh, if you are not unsure with uh, the status of that instrument, if it is used or not, uh, please be reminded that if you are not unsure with any instruments, if it is clean or not, then you should consider it automatically as contaminated. Sent to biomedical department for inspection, you are not allowed to send any um, unclean instruments to biomedical department. So it should be handled as contaminated. So if you are not sure, for example, if this instrument is uh, clean or not, then you need to consider it uh, as contaminated, even it uh, visually it is clean. So patient care equipment that is not visibly soiled should be handled as contaminated. Patient care equipment that is not visibly soiled and appears clean may still harbor microorganism that may pose a threat to patient and staff. Therefore, they should be handled as if they are contaminated and not clean. So which of the following organization requires an MSDS or material safety data sheet? or the MSDS to be maintained okay is it a the joint commission Letter B, FDA. Letter C, OSHA. Letter D, EPA. So which of the following organization requires a MSDS be maintained with information on all potentially dangerous chemicals used in workplace? For joint commission, that's possible. They will need it as per requirements, facility requirements. For FDA, it is not the FDA who will mandate it. For AP, uh, for OSHA, that's possible. For EPA, that's also possible. For Joint Commission, there are just uh, mandatory requirements of each facility. So it's either the facility will comply or not as per the Joint Commission. If uh, that facility is not member of the Joint Commission, then they are not uh, they are not required to follow whatever the Joint Commission is telling. But the Joint Commission is on also um, relying on other organization, which is OSHA, CDC, um, APEC for infection control, and World Health Organization protocols. So your remaining is 
OSHA and EPA. So it is your OSHA that requires to maintain the MSDS. Guys, your OSHA requires any staff that is working with hazardous um, materials to have HASCOM or hazard communication lecture. or training, PPE training, chemical spill management training, science and warn, um, science and labels, it is OSHA who mandated that you need to be familiarized. For EPA, it is the label of the chemicals. And disposal of the chemicals to environment. So to maintain uh, the MSTS, because um, as per the mandate of OSHA, they need to protect its um, worker or occupational worker to any hazardous or any um, hazardous uh, working conditions. For in CSSD, we are working with chemicals. We are facing with chemicals. That's the reason why there is a there is specific um, PPE intended for that area as per OSHA guidelines. So hazard communication is one of them. You cannot be deployed in uh, CSSD if you don't have hazard communication training, PPE training, chemical spill management training, and signs and labels. So your MSTS, they are requiring um, your MSTS, especially with your chemical spill management. It, your, MS is, your MSDS is part of your chemical spill management. If ever there are incidents of chemical spill, how you will handle any chemical spill as per MSDS or what PPE you need to wear as per your MSDS. So if there are incidents of um, chemical spill to your skin, to your eyes, then you need to follow the MSDS on how to handle that scenario. So if ever your um, MSDS said that you need to rinse your eyes within, uh, with a running water for 15 minutes, then you need to follow it. So the OSHA requires that the material safety data sheet be maintained with information on all potentially dangerous chemicals used in the workplace, um, all hazardous chemicals actually, and even uh, non-hazardous, non even um, distilled, they are asking for MSDS. So that's it for today. Um, do you have any questions? Do you have any questions, guys? before we will end our um, discussion for today. Okay, I think we, we will end now our discussion. Um, 
for next week, we will, uh, the next topic is, I think, chapter 12 and chapter 13. Or if we can merge the chapter 12 to chapter 15, 14 or 15, then we will do it. We will try to um, compress all the lectures. Um, we will try to open more practice questions session so that we are we can be familiarized with um, test taking strategies and how to uh, answer exams, how to eliminate, how to um, look for important uh, details on the questions and how to eliminate uh, every options and how to rationalize every options. So um, by this week, I will release one account. There are a lot of um, online account, uh, online lectures there from hand washing for endoscope processing for um, sterilization, disinfection, all chemicals, then um, chemical indicator. I will issue those um, account. It is the same as for do, but it is free, free account. So I will. I will issue them to you so that you have um, other resources. So thank you for joining our class for today and see you next week. Thank you guys.